Recap and top jump off moments. Now, first, let me give you my review. Now, my review scale is based on the one to tail scale. One meaning it's shit. Ten meaning it is the Battle of Blackwater, which, in my opinion, is the greatest Game of Thrones episode ever made. All right. So, right off the back, my review for this episode. I'm just going to say straight up. It's a 7.5. I'm going to say the same thing for it was last week to this week. I think that it's treading water. I think it's good. I, I, I think it's going in the right direction. I still think it's building up. But we get a couple of major mo uh, things in this episode that go down. And one really, really big thing that goes down, I think. So uh, probably not what other people think is the big thing. But one really big thing to me that goes down. So my first jump off moment well let's just say this is my first not number one jump off moment my first jump off moment is the faith militant is reinstated now to me this is one of the biggest mistakes Cersei could ever have made it's basically like putting al-qaeda or any other uh, religious overzealous religious movement in power and giving them the power to grab you up. It's like people that could just run up on you and just say, oh, you're not you're not well wearing nothing over your face or some chick in the Middle East, grab her up and do whatever they want, and the cops can't do anything about it. This is basically what she has unleashed upon Westeros. And we could see right from the back how it ends that it's coming for her, and she really set herself up with this. So we basically start off at the, the King's Landing at the small council table, and they're talking about going to Brinker Bravas has called in for at least one-fourth of their money. So Mace Tyrell said that he's willing to put up his own money from the House Tyrell to pay the crown, but Cersei turns this down and says that he needs to go treat with the Iron Brinker Bravos personally. She also says that she's going to send Merrin Trent, the King's Guardman, down there with him. Now Mace Tyrell is portrayed as a buffoon and, in this show, and he's dancing around, and he's, and he's bopping his head and jumping around and all excited and happy to go and to go and do it and he goes off and he does it and I really do not like the way that they're portraying him I hope that the, that is uh, later rectified after that we see Cersei meet with the high sparrow now the thing I, I remember about this scene the most is when the scene first starts we see a piece of paper there with the stamp of Littlefinger on it so Littlefinger has sent her a message back and by this, from this message and from what's going on, this is when she reinstates the face militant. We then see the face militant go inside the brothel of a little finger and just tear people up. And especially the gay person. They do extra work to the gay person. And that is explicitly shown. After that, we see Lancel getting, you know, basically turned into a face militant with his head chopped open and carved open and he gets his head chopped open as soon as he's done with that they send him out to go get Loris Tyrell and they just grab Loris Tyrell up and imprison him straight up because he's committed uh, atrocities against the crown now obviously if we go by the fact that we see the paper from Littlefinger to Cersei and then we see them run up in the brothel and find homosexuality going on there and then grab up Lanso Lannister we have to assume that Littlefinger is the one who put that whole event into play for them to get grabbed up like that for Cersei. So, Marjorie goes to Tommen screaming on Tommen like, yo, you're the king. How are you allowing your mom to do this? Tommen then goes to his mom. His mom's like, I ain't got nothing to do with it. You're the king. Go handle your business. He goes and tries to handle his business, and then the crowd just starts calling him bastard and abomination and bastard and abomination. And I wish Cersei would have been there to hear that because she could see that is coming back to bite her in the ass. Because if it's a bastard and he's an abomination, it's because of her. And eventually it's going to come back and bite her because of it. And 
Timing cannot even get close to the high sparrow, so he jumps back inside his thing, drives off with people calling him that. Marjorie gets mad that he can't do nothing, realizes she's married to a little boy, and she goes off and has to call her grandmother to get some help for that situation. So that is how that ends, and that is that jump off moment. My next jump off moment is Jamie and Bron and Dawn. Now, we see that Jamie pays a man to smuggle them into Dawn. Now, later on, we find out that this man that smuggles them into Dawn, even though Jamie does pay him a handsome sum of money, tells one of the Sand Snakes, Nymeria, saying that he has smuggled them in, and he still gets buried in his head up to sand, and a spear thrown to his face later for his troubles. Well, on that thing, Jamie and Bron, they have a little talk on the boat, and Jamie tells Bron why he has, why he has to do it, and basically goes into this whole thing about Tyrion. Now, he says he would kill Tyrion if he sees him. I don't know if I believe that, if that, or he's just talking shit at that particular time. I don't know if he would do anything like that. So they basically, they get there. Bron rolls him to the boat. He gets him on to Dawn. They get in the Dawn. The four riders come looking for him. Bron takes out three of them, injures one of them so Jamie can fight with him. And we see Jamie fighting with the bad hand, and he sucks. Uh, I know Jamie was supposed to be one of the greatest fighters of the Seven Kingdoms, and now he's terrible. But Corrin Halfhand, fighter of the Night's Watch, had his hand chopped off. Turned to his left hand and still became one of the greatest fighters with his other hand. So I don't know how Jamie couldn't really do it. And to me, I don't know why they just don't make like a hilt on his hand for the sword. So the sword could just automatically be stuck to that hand. And then he could just swing it around like that. I don't know, but he eventually does some maneuver where he, the guy swings the sword. He grabs it inside of the golden hand, grabs his sword, stabs the guy up and gets lucky. And Mitzi gets lucky and kills this guy. Later on, we finally meet some of the Sand Snakes. So we see this lady. Now we see a we see a Oberyn's uh, a baby's mama just riding the shit out that horse. Now he's a great rider, especially compared to what we've seen with Podrick. And she runs up on her daughter and then Nymeria and Obara. And she basically, after she hears the story that Nymeria tells about Jamie Lannister being in Dorne, she comes tells him, "Listen, you have to choose a side. You're gonna be with me in war or Doran in peace." And they all choose to go with her in war. And we get this thing from Obara who says that how Oberyn came to her when she was a baby and put a spear at his feet and said, you choose to stay with your mother, be with her tears, or be a fighter with me. And you see her grab the spear, kick it up in the air, and throw it at the guy's head. Me, personally, I thought that scene looked very cheesy for her throwing that spear through the guy's head. I wish they wouldn't have done it like that. It just didn't look, it looked too fake for me. I understand what point they were trying to get across that she's not having it, but it looked pretty cheesy to me. So they all decide to go with her and all decide to take on war. That is basically what we get out of that whole situation. Now, my next jump off moment is basically the Sons of the Harpy. Now, people may think this is the number one moment, but not to me. Though it's a very important moment. So we start off here with this moment on Tyrion and Jorah. And we see Jorah steal a boat and then give the guy the money after he knocks him out and throw Tyrion on the boat. Now while they're riding, Tyrion re realizes who Jorah Mormont is and the reason why he's taking him. Tyrion keeps talking. Jorah doesn't like him talking. Punches him in the mouth and knocks him over and stuff like that. That's how that goes down. Then we see Bad Danny talking to Bar Barris and Sam, and he's telling her a story about Rhaegar Targaryen and how him and Rhaegar would like to go out in the streets and play the harp for people and collect money and sometimes to give the money to charity, sometimes to drink with it. But he was a really great singer. And it just shows another story that Barris is telling her about a family that she has no idea about anything or anybody in her family. And she's very happy to get this information. Later, we see this dude that likes to come out with his ass all out and shit, Dario. And his ass ain't out this time, but... This dude comes out there and says, oh, you know, you got to have a little council meeting with his daughter and I can protect you. So she tells Barristan to go walk the streets and just have some fun. So while they're talking to his daughter, now his daughter's telling Danny again, listen, customs and tradition of this city are all that keeps this city together. And you cannot just change customs. And she decides that she just wants to change the customs, change the traditions, not listen to anyone, just do what she wants to do, and not reopen the fighting pits. From this, her not willing to do this, we see the Sons of the Harpy slitting a man's throat, and then when... 
the unsullied come to the rescue. They are set up by a slave woman. Now we see the slave woman is the one that set them up, showing that the slave people are turning on Danny. And they uh, grab the unsullied up in basically a urban combat warfare. And these unsullied are more made for like a... They're more made for warfare, open warfare, field warfare, where they got big long spears. We're in their urban landscape, and these big long spears are not effective. And they basically are taken out. And you see Grey Worm, he's doing his best to fight these people off, and he's doing a good job. And basically, he's at his wit's end. He's trying to fight them off by himself, and, you know. And then Barris and Selmy comes in there, and you hear the music change. When Sir Barrison gets in there, and he just starts going through these guys. And... <laughs> hacking these dudes up, but then he gets caught and stabbed in the ribs. So he gets bagged up because the bottom line is this. An injured lion can be taken down by a pack of mangy dogs. And that's the bottom line. It doesn't matter how great of a fighter you are, how big you are. Ants take out the biggest of creatures all the time. It is by numbers. And that's basically what happens. And it seems like, so what we see here in this scene, now this is what I see. It seems like Barrison is about to die. Before he's about to die and the guy's about to cut his throat and kill him, we see Grey Worm come and kill that guy. Grey Worm then looks over, checks at Barrison. Barrison's not moving. And then Grey Worm collapses on him. Now, from that scene, it leads you to believe that they have both passed away. But I don't think, I don't know why they would have Grey Worm make that last ditch effort to save the guy from slitting his throat if Barrison was just going to be dead anyway. So I'm not sure if Barrison is dead, but I am 100% sure that Grey Worm is dead. And that is where I'm going to leave that situation. So now, my number one jump off moment of this episode. And that to me is... Jon Snow's parents are revealed. That is right. That is what this episode is to me. The re revelation of who Jon Snow's parents are. And maybe you had, didn't catch it. Or maybe you didn't see it that way. But that is exactly what this episode did. And that's what it was about. So I'm going to tell you exactly how the episode did it. So first we see Stannis talking to his wife. Right? Now... When he's talking to his wife, they're sitting over and they're looking at John. And she says, you admire this kid. I should have gave you a son. And he just stands is like, listen, he's a law commander of a nice watch. You know, I got respect for this dude. She's jealous because she didn't give him a son. And so she says, yeah, he's a bastard by some tavern slut. And Stannis specifically says, Ned Stark was not like that. That's clue number one right there. Of who Jon Snow's parents is. Alright. Take that as the first clue. Alright. Stannis. Says Ned wasn't like that. And um. She says that uh. She should have gave him a boy. Mel comes down. And then says. That's King Stannis' daughter. She has his blood running through her veins. And gives Shalice a look. Shalice looks at, at, at Melisandre. A little nervous. When she sees that look. And then runs away right after that. So. After that, we see Stannis. She said to Stannis, listen, are you going to leave me behind again like that Davos talked you into it? And he's like, no, I'm not leaving you behind. I need you. She's like, you don't need me. You just need the Lord of Light. So I think it's very important that Stannis is bringing Melisandre. Now, in the books, that does not happen. Stannis does not bring Melisandre. But here he is bringing Melisandre with him. And she says, you only need the Lord, Lord of Light. And then he goes, what do you need? And she goes, to serve my Lord. And she looks right at John when she says it. So, after that, we see John talking to Mullis. We see Stannis talking to Shireen. And Shireen comes in there, and she says, Are you embarrassed of me, father? Now, Stannis goes into a very human Stannis, and I hope people like Stannis more because of this. He tells the whole story of how Shireen got grayscale from a, a, a gift that was given to her 
and uh, it looked like uh, some type of biological warfare like uh, the Americans did to the, well not the Americans, the Spaniards did to the American Indians by giving them smallpox in their, inside of their, uh, their blankets and killing all their babies and everything else. Same situation where Gravescale was performed on Shireen instead of sending him to the Stone Men. And here we have another mention of the Stone Men, which makes me believe that we will see Stone Men this season. So uh, we see, he, they tell her to send her off to the Stone Men, but she's like, no. She's a princess. She's Princess Shireen of the House Baratheon. She was my daughter. And he called on every mace that he could find and they cured her grayscale. And then he hugs her and we get a little emotional moment. Now this scares me. This right here. Because first we have the scene with Melisandre talking about the blood to Shireen. And then we see Shireen asking Stannis if he loves her. And then we see the big emotional moment. It scares me for both Stannis but it scares me more for Shireen that something bad is going to happen to Shireen after seeing this situation. All right, after that, we see John talking to Mel. Now, John is in there with Sam, and they're going over people trying to ask for more troops to guard the wall. He goes through a bunch of names, gets to the Boltons. He's mad about it. And then Melisandre comes in, and then Sam walks out. Now, she pulls out those titties of her, and titties are pretty small, but those are some nice teardrop-shaped titties. And uh, she, John, puts his hands up on that boob, and he's happy to do it, and I, I don't blame that man for being happy to do that, you know what I mean? So he gets his hand up on that boob, and he can feel her heart beating through it, he says, you know what I mean? But he pulls his hand back, and it's like, I'm in love with another. She's like, dead people don't need no love. And she's, he's like, yeah, but I still do love her, so I can't fuck with you. And she walks out, and then we get the iconic line, you know nothing, Jon Snow. So we got that line. I'm happy we got that line. Uh, and I'm sure that people are happy that that line comes. Now, we go to Sansa in the Winterfell Crips. Now, Sansa is in the Winterfell Crypts, and she is standing by the statue of Lyanna Stark, her aunt. And there is a white, and while she lights the flower, then there is a white feather she picks up specifically right there. All right? So remember, she picks up the white feather. They light the candle of Lyanna's. Little Finger comes over to her and tells her the story of Liana and Rhaegar. Now, we must be reminded, this is the second mention of Rhaegar this episode. First, we have it with Barris and Selmy, and Daenerys, and how a nice of a guy Rhaegar was, playing a harp. And now we have a mention of, of him. And Littlefinger's like how in awe he was, being a no one at this tournament, and watching all these great men fight. And he says, basically, how many people had to die because Le Rhaegar chose Lyanna. And then Sansa says, yeah, he chose her, and then he kidnapped her and raped her. And if you look at Littlefinger's face, after she says that, you clearly see that that was not the case. And he knows that that was not the case. And then right after that, he says, let's walk somewhere where the dead cannot hear us. So then they walk away from Lyanna's statue. And he tells him the whole situation. Listen, I got to bounce. Stannis Baratheon is coming. And now we see what Littlefinger's plan is. And I guess he's hedging his bets. He's hedging his bets that Stannis is going to come to Winterfell and be able to take Winterfell because Stannis is the best military commander in the Seven Kingdoms. So he says when Stannis does take Winterfell, he's going to make her the wardeness of the North. Now, if Stannis gets killed and doesn't take one of felt, then tells Sansa just to wrap little, just to wrap Ramsay around her finger, which she has already done because she already likes it. And then that way he, she can be controlled the North. So that is, I guess, Littlefinger's plan to control the North. He said that he has to go off and see, uh, see Cersei, and he has to bounce from there. So that that is exactly what is going on there so as i said that john snow's parents are revealed i will break it down for you again real quick if you did not catch it liana it says basically right there stannis tells you that ned stark would not cheat on his wife he's not that type of guy so that breaks away that ned is not john's mother she tells you straight up that's not john's father i mean that's that. Boom. You go right to the Crips of Winterfell with John and Lyanna. With Lyanna and in there, 
And we hear the story of Liana and Rhaegar. And that is John's parents. And that is why that story was told right then. And that's why Rhaegar was brought up twice. And I think that is what the big reveal of this episode is. That R plus L does equal J. So, again, I must say that this episode to me was a 7.5. I thought it was very interesting, very good, and I was very happy to see it. So, listen, any questions, please put it down in the comment section. I will answer all questions with a question mark on the TMB review show that I will be doing on Bar the Poto's channel this Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern. I have a link in the description, too, that you could put down there. And on you could put all the questions on this app on the Google Plus page in the description that's there. If you want questions answered for there too, you can leave it there and then she will get it and it's pretty much easier to do it that way. But either way you do it, please submit your questions. Please thumb up this video if you like it. Please subscribe. Please subscribe and help my house grow. And until next time, peace. Stay safe. Tony Teflon, Tony Tony Teflon, Tony Teflon, Tony Tony Teflon, Teflon 316. Peace. And I'm out. Stay sexy.